The thesis of this talk is that music and art have their origins in bluff. The bluffing is an epiphenomenon of domestication and arises with the impotent and the disadvantaged. This might seem counterintuitive given that we are today used to the powers that be making the most noise, e.g. governments, newspapers, TVs, the loud ads of big business generally. Our response to this is that noise making in a highly domesticated species starts to develop a momentum of its own to the point of coming to completely dominate the older powers of nature and has, with humans, ended up being the only game in town. An adjunct to this thesis is that everyday language contains clues to the fact that we have never really escaped from our originary bluffing and further that we can't. Traces of childhood remain in the successfully transitioned adult. This talk was first given on the 22nd of November 2017 and is being given today, Thursday, the 23rd of February 2020. The Origin of Music and All Art Introduction According to the rock and jazz drummer Bill Bruford, the first moment in music occurred when two of our distant forefathers were in a cave and one of them, let's call him Caveman One, rattled some bones and the other one, Caveman Two, said, whoa, do that again. This type of thinking about origins is well known to us. It involves imagining a single etiological first moment. This moment stretches into a story. And the story has entities in it which are just like us, so humans or anthropoid powers. And these beings have the same sort of thought processes that someone might characteristically have in our own time. In the case of the Bruford percept on music, there was a performer, there was an audience member, and there was an aesthetic event. So somebody did something and somebody else thought it was interesting, pleasurable, or life enhancing. This in turn would have emboldened the performer to do it again. And we might say by way of conclusion that the stage was now set for the quotes performance to happen over and over again and with similar pleasing results. The history of music could now be rolled out. A story like that of the cavemen and the rattling bones is helpful with regard to the origin of music, but only in a preliminary way. It helps us to do some first thinking on the topic of music, but it's just art about art. It's allowed us to, quotes, identify with the characters. It's afforded us the opportunity to feel a mystical connection to, in particular, Caveman 2. He was first experiencing, and from the story, we are allowed to do some first experiencing of our own. It may be that Caveman 2 was being reminded by Caveman 1's bone rattling of a shower of icicles or of a rustle of leaves in a cool wind or of playing with shells at the beach as a child. In other words, he was being reminded of some initial experience of being captivated by the outside world. But first thoughts like that of the men in the cave and like the ones in Bibles and in Iliad Odysseys whilst they may get us started on thinking and may offer some sort of language limited explanation of where and how a phenomenon began, they do not help us out scientifically. And it is the purpose of this talk to make a case that music has its origins 
long before the advent of humans and their aesthetic excitations and begins far back in time when animals began to make noise. Our goal in this talk will be to give a scientifically based account of how music emerged and to argue in particular that music and art are epiphenomena of domestication. According to me and in line with my talk of 2015, domestication and speciation are substantially the same thing. The argument of that paper goes something like this. Animals become a species by, so to speak, sinking into the landscape. They find a place to live in, a domus, and then adapt to living in it. Think of, say, a Darwinian Galapagos finch evolving just the right beak for cracking the particular type of nut on its particular island. The ideas of Darwin, however, only very partially explain this settling in process. Animals didn't only self-select on the basis of geophysics, they have also learned to cope with a problem that arises from their success in self-selection. The problem of population increase. After an initial domestic establishing through either lucky circumstances or success in competing against a group in their vicinity, the incipient species learns to carry out rudimentary intraspecific competition with one, warning signals, aposomatics, and two, with rudimentary intraspecific specific capitulations, like those discussed by Conrad Lorenz, so-called triumph rite ceremonies. And an amalgam of one and two gives rise to a tolerable social order. Therefore, with speciation, there is not only a natural selection in the Darwinian sense, or a survival of fittest in the Herbert Spencerian sense, but also an evolutionary process born of a phase two phenomenon, of a sort of super organizing within the species. The success of a species generates the need for internal communication and internal signaling to, in the first instance, keep aggression down between the individual members of the species, and in the second instance, to self-prioritize the individual in this new world of domesticity. It is to certain aspects of the peculiarities of this internal signaling that results from domestic success, in particular the role of bluff, that we are turning our attention today. Part one, why do animals make noise? The first moments of domestication and insights from AI about the onset and persistence of game playing. In the usual primary interactions that take place between prey and predators, there is no reason to be making noise. The prey animals need to be quiet in order to avoid tipping off the predators as to where they are, and the predator animals need to be quiet in order to avoid telling the prey animals when they are arriving. So just from these two general observations, we can get a sense that animal noise did not have its origins in the domain of capital T-W, the wild. Noise has instead arisen in an altogether different domain, the domestic. A bit more precisely, noise has arisen between one, conspecifics, and between two, animals that are in some significant way evenly matched. And in particular between three, animals that are likely to run into each other a lot. I've drawn a diagram to demonstrate this bifurcating process. Here are two multicellular creatures or animals They are not necessarily conspecifics, but are two animals that, for our purposes, are roughly the same size, although one is bigger than the other. And its bigness can just be emblematic of some other advantage. Out in the wild, for every time that this 
bigger animal can deliver a blow. And I've drawn here three top down blows. The smaller one is able to deliver a responsive biting blow from below. So here, there are these three upthrusting blows, and they are of sufficient commensurability to allow us to say that these two animals live in a state of survival equilibrium. They run into each other in the wild, but it doesn't result in either one of them becoming, say, the other one's dinner or being fatally damaged in the encounter. So out in the wild, these two emblematic entities are in a state of a standoff equilibrium. Now, imagine a world of changed circumstances, a world where these two entities are no longer in the wild, but are instead living in a state of domestication. Here, assuredly, they are much more likely to be conspecifics, such as offspring and progenitor, younger sibling, older sibling, etc. But also bear in mind that domestication can throw up all manner of ostensibly harmonious relationships, including, for instance, parasitic ones. So we are being deliberately inspecific about the identity of our two new entities in this new regime, just for the moment. The point, however, to be made about the move to domestication is that it brings profound consequences. The smaller animal, the physically disadvantaged animal, or for the some other reason disadvantaged animal, such as the animal that is technically less capable, can't crack a nut, can't build a nest, can't be evasive, can't spit poison, can't do much with its teeth or claws. This animal has got a problem. And it is a problem that presents itself day in and day out. Now that the two animals are domestic pals, the smaller animal finds itself losing out to or being edged out by or becoming dependent on the bigger animal in any of their routine encounters. And what happens to an animal that finds itself in a one-on-one -on -one agon involving chronic disadvantage? The answer that I'm suggesting to you today comes to us from developments in game theory and artificial intelligence. The chronic loser resorts to bluff. We've known a bit about bluff as a serious academic matter since at least as far back as Wittgenstein and his observations about humans using sentences that contain words like perhaps and maybe. These are sentences that don't make any actual claim about the world, or even more troublingly, make two completely contradictory claims about the world simultaneously. So for instance, John is perhaps better off than he would have been. John is perhaps an Indian. John is perhaps an accountant. These sentences, as a matter of basic logic, can be unpacked to mean John is X and John is not X. He's both better off and not better off than he would have been. He's both an Indian and not an Indian. He both is and isn't an accountant. With those sentences, the speaker has, as we are wont to say, insinuated a topic. They have hinted at a state of affairs without taking the responsibility filled step of making an actual claim about the world, let alone stating a fact about it. Having introduced the topics of the statistical probabilities for John's welfare, John's nationality or ethnicity, John's day job, the speaker is directing the listener to where they wish to take the discussion. They are establishing a ballpark, but without saying anything about the type of game, the participants, the goalposts, etc. They just want to get you through the turnstile. In short, they are engaging in the weakest imaginable form of agenda setting. Most likely their hope is for a weak, low level discussion, or better still, no discussion at all, to take place on John's welfare, nationality, day job, and all with the goal of the weakly asserted proposition resulting in an easy, trouble-free, informational victory. 
The problem of the human use of vague, ambiguous, and generally unhelpful statements can, however, be better understood by considering the parallel theoretical problems of two card games, poker and bridge. First, poker. By far the world's most popular card game and on which by far we have the most to say. In papers written in the 1920s and later on in the basically unreadable book, The Theory of Games, 1953, the mathematician, physicist, artificial intelligence and computer pioneer, John von Neumann, advanced the view that bluffing at poker is a necessity. Because there are, roughly speaking, optimal equilibrium strategies at pro poker, think optimal strategies for betting accurately with promising hands, poker could in theory go the way of tic-tac-toe, i.e. noughts and crosses, and become a completely, quotes, solved game. And hence, in a way, a dead-end activity. What, however, makes poker a viable human pastime is bluffing. So pretending to have more when you have little, and not really concerning us just at the moment, pretending to have little when you have a lot. And bluffing, thought von Neumann, is a must if you are planning on beating any competent opponent. Quite possibly because von Neumann himself was not a particularly good poker player, but also because when it comes to games of chance, each man is his own expert. His precept was placed injudiciously in the extreme into the great dustbin of mere historical intellectual curiosities. Or if people could actually understand what he was saying, they couldn't think how such an idea could help with other intellectual problems. Nowadays, 90 years on, the significance of his views in an era of game-playing computers is abundantly clear. And we need here to give a thumbnail sketch of the curious phenomenon of computers playing games against world-class human experts. A very significant and highly publicized event in AI versus humans occurred in first February 1996 and then in May 1997. An IBM computer called Deep Blue played chess against the world champion chess player Garry Kasparov. In the six games of 1996, Kasparov won 4-2, and in 1997, Deep Blue won 3.5 to 2.5. And, and so it was with the second series that a somewhat shocked world learned for the first time that computers could in fact outthink humans. There were a number of points of interest in this 12 game series, but I only want to direct your attention to one of them. It is the final moment of the sixth game in 1996, where this was the state of play. Deep blue, black, up by one point, pawn, resigns at the 43rd move. I'll just prove to you he's up by one pawn. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Up by one pawn and resigns. Uh, two rooks, two rooks. Uh, and a queen each and a bishop each. Notice a really odd thing about this game. Look how cramped black has become. Deep blue seems to have retreated to this corner of the board. Here are all his major pieces. The queen, the two rooks, the bishop, all jammed together. Something has gone horribly wrong. And this game, like no other, exposed a profound flaw in the computer strategy. Just a brief explanation of what's happening here is that 
the threat is that this queen will be moved here and and there will be there'll be a forced exchange of queens and this pawn will make it to the seventh rank and cause mayhem at the back. In programming, Deep Blue, the computer experts designed the computer strategy to be one of pursue any clear advantage relentlessly, but, and here's the critical point, if the computer could see no clear way forward, it was to opt for a waiting move. Now, waiting moves are a well-known and common strategy in chess. When a player wishes to see a bit more of what is emerging on the board, they simply make a move of no importance behind the line of action. Very typically a piece not already uh, taking an active role in the game is just moved, say, one square sideways. Only what has happened here is that the computer has taken this instruction too literally. And after White's advances has ended up in a losing position that not even a bad beginner could have arranged. Now, obviously, 15 months later, the computer has been radically improved to the point of being able to edge out Kasparov in the next series of six games. However, the flaw in plain sight of our game six of series one has highlighted a major problem for the computer programmers of the upcoming generation. And in more recent times, this flaw has been overcome. Really, the idea that programmers could just pack good chess stratagems into their computers when they are more or less by definition not themselves high-level chess players was, to put it mildly, misconceived. And the general consensus is that it was something of a miracle that Deep Blue won the second series of 1997, and possibly a miracle that it won any games at all, which is apparently Kasparov's latest opinion. Nowadays, a completely new strategy has been adopted for programming computers to play human experts at games. Exploiting the vastly increased speeds and bigger memory of today's computers, the new strategy is to simply tell the computer what the rules and objectives of the game are. And just let it play millions of practice games against itself. The success of some of the new computers has been spectacular. Earlier this year, Google's AlphaGo beat the, North, beat the South Korean world champion at the ancient Chinese board game Go. And a computer has, first in 2015, lost only narrowly to, and then in 2016, beaten all its opponents in a special event poker tournament in America. This brings us, at long last, to the article by Adam Kucharski in New Scientist, August 20th last year, about the momentous developments that are going on with modern bots, and discusses the American poker tournament we've just mentioned. Something altogether extraordinary is happening with some of these modern bots. The computer at the Special Event Pennsylvania Poker Tournament had taught itself to bluff. Artificial intelligence has finally corroborated the idea outlined by von Neumann nearly a century ago, bluffing at poker is a necessity. How did the computer discover this? through regret minimization. Now, if you were to suggest to poker or bridge players that they need to resort to minimizing their regret, they would say to you, oh yeah, tell me about it. I'm all in favor, but I'm not sure that life is long enough to be able to make much progress on minimizing my huge number of tournament playing regrets. The regret, however, being referred to here is a technical term. In the millions, actually billions, of hands of poker that a computer can play against itself, it can put together vast amounts of data on discrepancies. Between hand value as determined by, let's call it, positivistic maths, and the actual results achieved on actual hands, those discrepancies go to make up concept 
regret. And parenthetically, it will in the future be the determining of regret which will allow computers to advance beyond and well beyond human thinking. So how to explain this? Probably the best way to help people understand this is to think of a game that I'm going to call Nearly Poker. In my invented game of Nearly Poker, there are roughly 10 types of hands or hands to begin with because in poker you frequently add to your hand. And they have a ranking in ability to win that is in the ratio of our numbers 1 to 10. In other words, 10 is likely to beat 5 twice as often as not, 9 is likely to beat 3, 3 times more often than not, and so on. So here are our 10 categories. Now with poker, in reality these hands might be quite a bit skewed because there are a lot of hands that never amount to much. So lots of poor hands in say these bottom four grades. And contrary wise, there would be only a small number of very good hands in our top three grades. But in my game, we are not concerned with that. Hence, these are evenly proportioned deciles. Now, what does the computer's regret minimization tell it about the outcomes for these lower hands? It will establish that these lower hands, the bottom four levels, will do better than their ratings and that these higher hands will do less well than their ratings, mainly because of the extreme danger of running into another high rated hand and losing large after a lot of betting. So let's draw the differential of regret. Here, going here, going there, going up here, then going here. We learn along with the computers that a certain amount of bluff will do better here in the middle accurate assessments will work best and another perhaps slightly unexpected finding not specifically the topic of this talk today but touched on in my talk of 2011 on humor under performances salvation and complex systems these upper hands 10 to 8 are best dealt with by under advertising and quieter betting. So in summary, if you were to act on regret minimization, you would end up bluffing at both ends of the spectrum of hand power. Just to give one quick example of how this primary or quotes aggressive bluffing could work, this bluffing down here. In the real world, consider this situation. There are five players. They all hold averagely bad hands and not unusual occurrence at poker. So hands from our one to four zone. The first player to bet instead of folding or checking, i.e. passing, or making some token bet, bets say double the token bet. Now if all the other four players feel sufficiently intimidated, they all fold and the first player wins the pot without him holding any particular hand, whatever. It, if he was about to lose to one, two, or even all four of the other hands, it doesn't matter. He just ends up winning with what might well be inferior cards. So I hope that helps with the topic of regret minimization and how it relates to modern developments with AI. I do, however, have to draw your attention to one more important element in von Neumann's thinking that is not mentioned by Kaczarski and which is beyond my nearly poker explanation. Von Neumann thought that there were two kinds of bluff. The first is the regular bluff we've been talking about, usually with a hand in the one to four zone, so pretending to have more when you actual, than you actually hold. But the second kind of bluff is bluff seen from a completely different angle. It's not my second type of bluff bidding low when you have good cards, zones 8 to 10. This is, let's call it, accommodative bluff. 
and is when you simply call or see your opponent, but with only average cards. This has come into the English language as calling somebody's bluff. Now, why is this itself a bluff? Well, let's first just state what von Neumann's view was. It's a defensive strategy of calling irregularly with average cards. So this is where you hold, say, level four cards and you end up against an opponent who has bid to indicate what sounds like levels five, six, and seven. And as an option, you just call, not because you have the value hand to win, but because of the possibility of finding the opponent holding the primary aggressive bluff. And so you plan on winning sometimes with a better low level hand than the opponent is holding. Enter counter bluff. Here one gets a window of insight into how the game could give rise to a certain amount of escalation on both sides, both by way of bluff. But where category two is a more measured stance to that adopted by the initiating and aggressive bluff, category one. Now, if you've followed everything I've said up to now, you might be interested to learn a detail just mentioned in passing by Kucharski. That the expert poker players have now, now since the tournament, the Pennsylvania tournament, have now modified their game when playing these bluffing capable bots to themselves be playing a game with less bluff and employing a greater reliance on accuracy. Because, critical point, now that bluff has become a new element in the always going to win strategy, it has become part of the new equilibria. And the human experts themselves find it advantageous to slightly retreat into accurate maths. Hence observe a sort of variation on the concept of arms race. Here, an arms race between inaccuracy and accuracy, but where greater accuracy is going to work out better in the long run. And notice further a point of more than passing interest, namely that it is not a foregone conclusion as to who will win head to head in competition between computers and human experts at poker in the future because of the process of a continual recalibrating between bluff and accuracy. And notice just quickly the case of the game of contract bridge, where humans are playing a game where the bidding to win the contract always takes place at quite a high level. And where as a result, bluff is so enmeshed in the accurate bidding that computers will not be beating humans at it for quite a while yet, if ever. Here we might be looking at an aspect of the idea introduced by Kurt Gödel in 1931, the undecidability principle, or to give it its correct name, the incompleteness theorem. Namely that there is a sort of black hole at the center of any system you devise. At what time in the future will a computer be able to cater for what a bridge player had for breakfast or how they are getting on financially? or how they are getting on with their spouse? How more generally could a computer cope with human spite or human exasperation? All of those things that I've just listed can be playing a role in what is going on at a bridge table. So just a quick summary of part one. We may seem to have drifted a long way from where we began. We started with the first moments in noise and have ended up with issues to do with humans playing games against computers in the last few years but I want to assure you that they are intimately connected. Everything here hangs on the idea of the first moments of domestication. And I need to insert just a little bit of explanation. The first moments in domestication that we are talking about have nothing to do with what are popularly held to be the first moments in domestication, even by textbooks in universities namely that period 10 or 11,000 years ago when humans learned how to domesticate some animals, some plants, and apparently themselves. 
The domestication we are talking about is one of a large number of moments in the deep history of animals. For instance, when a bird built the first nest and provided a place for its young to live, it fatefully changed its own species permanently. Sequestered from the outside world, the bird's chicks became protected from, quotes, the wild and the wind and the cold. With better life security and with thermoregulation under control, the chicks have time on their hands to promote themselves with their parents and start putting their energy into squawking for attention and food. So begins a long story of self-promoting noise ranged against the powers that be. A story whereby the powers that be, the majorants, to use von Neumann's preferred term, probably from French mathematics, take on some of the tactics of the minorants. Since, to make an obvious point, the young grow up to be adults. But in any case, animals continually find themselves in non-lethal one-on-one confrontations with animals in their vicinity. And so, long before the time of humans, animals are already involved in one big symphony of noise born of domestication. Part two, from noise to music. So far we've explained only how noise began. Now it's time to turn our attention to music. What's the difference? Music is noise that humans like. But why do humans like certain types of noise? The answer to this seems to be that particular noises evoke certain moods. And taking up residence within these moods from time to time energizes or consoles or even provides instruction for human brains. The first people to ponder this problem, as far as I know, are the Greeks. Rather helpfully, the Greeks give commentary on what they call tone, a word that has had a long run in Western ideas about music and art. What the Greeks meant by hoi tonoi, tones, was rather specific. They were what we today would prefer to des describe as styles, whilst many writers have given a list of tonoi that could run to 10 or 12, there was an agreement that there were three main ones, Dorian, Phrygian, and Lydian. The Dorian, as its name suggests, was more appropriate to the mainland Greeks themselves, a style that was masculine, moderate, regular. Phrygian, in other words, pertaining to Northern Anatolians and people who were either not Greek or not really Greek, was a style that was womanish, or men out of control-ish, overexcited, agitated. Lydian, in other words, pertaining to central and southern Anatolians, or to Mesopotamian types, was something of a verso of the Phrygian style, a style of indolence and melancholic stupor. So when Greeks explained music to themselves, they were indulging in what would seem to us today a sort of aesthetic racism. However, it's all rather revealing. Whilst music placed you, you the average Greek, at the centre of an aesthetic realm, it also allowed you to travel to extraordinary, odd, mentally different places. Somehow I don't think this idea has ever really gone away. Music places you, you the listener, at the centre of experience but also allows you to travel to the land of extreme experiences. So in a song, an everyday song, you will frequently have a singer expressing some easily identifiable uh, sentiments or some intelligible storyline, but that singing voice finds itself within some wider context finds itself amidst a varied accompaniment of musical instruments which usher the basic sentiments or basic storyline of the singing voice through an exotic terrain. 
So what I think remains to be explained is, how did we go on the journey from the origins of noise to the performance of an entertaining and emotional display? Where you, the listener, find yourself swimming in a bath of emotions of someone else's devising, perhaps accompanied by or directed by the singing voice, and thinking to yourself, oh yes, that's an authentic expression of some point of view or some aspect of experience. To do this, let's recapitulate what is happening at the beginning of the journey. Animals were living in the wild, but then they domesticate themselves. With the onset of domestication, you have the expression of noise. And once you have this noisy expressivity in a species, you have animals actively working on having something to express. But do they have something to express? Because the expressors are in the first instance minorants engaged in a sort of game playing situation, there is a significant element of bluff to the allegedly important noise communications. So how does bluffing noise come to mean something? Well, initially, noise assuredly means I'm here, I'm healthy, I have my mouth open, and in some cases, so how about feeding me? And in other cases, so how about backing off in case I bite you? But also there can be a more evolutionary or existential message. And that is, if you want your genetic material to survive, and if you want extra participants in your struggle against your competitor conspecifics or actual random predators, then pay attention to my demands. That's initially. But what happens next? According to me, it's all about number. One verbal utterance, such as a squawk, a roar, a bark, can indicate some single thing, such as hunger or a threat. But an iteration, say two squawks, strengthens the claim. I'm still hungry and only getting hungrier. And all of a sudden, iteration is becoming a marker for insistence and seriousness. It is with this development that the species has become a cohort of maths users. Next, the species learns that their insistence can be coded not only through sheer repetition and the rhythmic patterns that can be set up by, so to speak, the repetitions of the repetitions, i.e. by the cyclic use of repetition, but also by pitch. The effort of the activity devoted to repetition can be matched by going higher and lower in pitch, by straining the voice. Notice taino, to strain and to stretch. And the noun tonoi had a primary meaning of simply scales. So you have to strain to go high and strain to go low. And both can signal seriousness and urgency. Shrieks and squeals up high, growls and grunts down low. And so it is that with rhythmic, rhythmic pattern and the use of pitch that a basic musicality, a meaning, a rationality, comes to be introduced to communications between conspecifics or to all but the deaf. And add to all this the calibrations of volume. They are a further indexing of insistence. Loud for I really mean it. We only need one more ingredient before the elaborate evolutionary use of noise becomes music, and that is mimicry. Mimicry emerges, I propose, from rather complicated issues to do with irony, the behavior of predators. The complicated issues are substantially to do with the von Neumann category two bluffers. The powers that be, together with the intermediate powers that be, see that a bluffing, pleading, pain declaring emotional use can work for them as well. After all, the powers themselves have to also negotiate hierarchy issues. Because as the world complexifies, anyone can end up as a minorant. 
a plaintiff in the court of life. In summary, on part two, the journey from noise to music is a much simpler problem than that of why there is a bluffing noise in the first place. Once you have iteration, pitch, volume, and the majorant incorporating the minorant techniques into its own advanced success story, it's not hard to understand the path from noise to music as the path to increased domesticity and the phenomenon of civilization. It's the success story that continually features a whining about an alleged impotence in the face of the gods, or the single capital G God, or the capital S state, or the really hard to defeat foe, capital N nature. Consider those art and significance defining texts, the epics. The Greeks at Troy being persecuted by the whims of the gods. The Israelites under Pharaoh and in the desert. The persecution of Jesus and his movement and the rebel alliance of Star Wars being persecuted and harassed by the Empire. A story with an explicitly biological central theme of a son being persecuted by a father. Part three, revisiting the men in the cave and reframing the problem of the origins of music as a listing of first moments. Let's now draw up a list of possible originary moments for music. Moment one, Music, it would be very hard to deny, started out as noise. At some unthinkable first moment in time, an animal discharged a guttural sound. It didn't really know what it was doing, but it got rewarded by another animal paying attention to it. Moment two occurs when an animal sees that our moment one animal is having success with his guttural noise experiment and mimics it. These first two moments are coincident with the onset of self-domestication in a species or being close at hand to observe it. Moment three only occurs much later. So moving rapidly along and skating clean past mere animals, we come to humans. The humans are signaling to each other. The hunter whistles to his fellow hunter. A mother murmurs and mutters and perhaps even hums rhythmically to an anxious child. Have we, with moment three, arrived at category music? Sort of. The hunter may be mimicking a bird to stalk prey, so irony, a high use of noise. And the whistling can involve accurate information being transmitted to his fellow hunter. Information such as, you go further right, or come back this way. So accurate information, again, a high use of noise. The mother may be adopting a von Neumann counterbluff strategy. Her noises are designed to express the idea, calm down, everything is going to be all right, and this is in response to the child's shrieking claim that the world is a disaster and that everything is not all right. The mother doesn't know that everything is going to be all right, but she wants to employ the strategy to have some domestic peace and to avoid raising a disturbed child that openly vents every fear or concern. However, notwithstanding the hunter's undoubted skill at whistling and the mother's undoubted skill in rhythmic song, I don't think these phenomena should qualify as music. And our next category will explain why. Moment four. Here we return to the cave and where this talk began. We don't, however, think that the first moment in music was a rattling of bones. But we do think a cave is fertile ground for the search. It's a simple matter of physics. Musical effects are generated by cylindrical structures like gullets or throats. The waves of noise bounce off the sides and the noise waves increase volume and tonality. Demonstrations with expensive props. And mm. 
With the phenomenon of caves, we might now be arriving at something that might conform to a modern person's conception of music. And there is a lot more to back up the idea that music began in caves. 35,000 years ago, something genuinely significant seems to have occurred in the history of our species. Around this time in caves in southern Europe, visual art starts to appear. In early TV documentaries about this phenomenon, the show presenters, perhaps with a knowledge that rocks and stalactites and stalagmites can make bell-like sounds, or with the presupposition that crowds of people may have come to either see or to make the cave paintings, uh, they would frequently refer to these sites as the cathedrals of early man. Now, however, we know that they are likely to be far more literally correct than they could ever have known. First of all, a number of odd discoveries have been made in European caves. Artworks have been found in some extremely cramped and difficult of access locations within caves. They are in places so difficult of access that it has raised questions about who was supposed to have viewed the art. Was it just for a select few? Or was it even for only one person, say the shaman of a group? Whatever the case, the nearly completely hidden images strongly suggest that what we are dealing with here is concept religion. The idea of hiding away sacred or special objects is prominent in the long history of religion. Further, amongst the cave wall images, there are some telling depictions depictions of animals and of animals being hunted. Originally, it was innocently thought that the animals depicted were a food source for the locals in the act of catching dinner. So it was something of a revelation to learn that the animals were not part of the locals' diet. Yes, the hunting figures may well represent the local hunters, but whatever it was they hunted, it was not the animals depicted. This is a clue to the idea that the image is religious. So sacred, abstracted, otherworldly. However, all that can be as it may, what is of most interest to us today has only been proposed just recently by people studying something called archaeoacoustics. According to at least one of these archaeoacousticians featured in the documentary, How Did We Get To Now? Episode six, Sound, Igor Reznikov, the images in the caves have been deliberately located at places of maximum acoustic advantage. In other words, it is most likely that the pictures were only part of some community activity and the community activity involved noise and highly probably song. This is now starting to look much more like what we would call music the phenomenon called since the time of Wagner, the Gesamtkunstwerk, the all-in performance, sound, visuals, drama, and perhaps dance. The noise here is being made in the context of a complete and emotionally involving experience of the world. The audience is enclosed in a bubble of sonic turbulence. But there is one obvious question that needs to be asked. This is happening in Southern Europe and 35,000 years ago. Why there and why then? There is a probable answer for this as well. Let's begin with a review of the historical situation. We can't say that art and music literally began 35,000 years ago because point number one, people were using red ochre from about 120,000 years ago. See the archeology span of the Classies, K-L-A-S-I-E-S site in South Africa. And because, point two, antlebone flutes have been found in Germany, dated to 43,000 years ago. But what I'm contending is that our full-blown aesthetic Gesamtkunstwerk may well have started in the middle of the period 40,000 to 30,000 years ago, owing to one single event. The event is called the Campanian Ignimbrite Eruption, hereafter CIE, and is dated to 39,280 years ago, give or take 110 years. 
dates are getting rather precise, even this far back. Campania is the district of central southern Italy. Ignimbrite is lumps of material that are produced by major volcanic events. And eruption here describes the action of a discharge from a supervolcano. The eruption came from a well-known seismic area west of modern-day Naples, known as the Campi Flegre, or in English, the Flegrian Fields, and is not far from the better known to history site of Mount Vesuvius. The volcano that famously rained down and buried Pompeii. There is quite a lot to explain here, but I'm only going to give the bare minimum. The CIE is a category seven on the volcanic explosivity index, which goes from naught to eight. Each level is an increase in explosivity by an order of a hundred times. To just give some points of comparison, the Mount Agung in Indonesia volcanic eruption of 1963, recently in the news because that volcano is giving signs of going again, was a level five. Vesuvius in 79 AD was also a level five. Krakatoa 1883 was a six. And for the classicist, the Thera Santorini eruption of 1620 BC was either a six or a seven. In the level eight category, there have only been four cases in the last 36 million years. Two in America, one in New Zealand, and one that deserves a little scrutiny from us, the Toba eruption of 74,000 years ago. Toba is in Sumatra. The emissions from Toba are thought to have engendered a worldwide volcanic winter of six to 10 years and possibly a thousand year long cooling event. Now, our CIE, only one category below, would in Campania, our CIE, would have had similar after effects, widespread climate altering and life threatening consequences. There would have been an acid rain phenomenon of sulfur dioxide and chlorine. This would have entered the plant biota and caused in humans dental fluorosis and eye, lung and organ damage. The ash itself would have had consequences for any life directly in its path, like killing it. And its path was considerable stretching from Italy throughout most of the Eastern Mediterranean, all the way down here, and making a swathe of hundreds of miles, of hundreds of miles wide that would have extended into Central Asia. It's with this geophysical scenario that I propose we think of our embryonically artistic species with its red ochre and antler flutes heading into caves. And for at least two reasons, one to avoid the acid rain and two to avail themselves of pockets of air within the caves and probably seeking less contaminated water. But onto these general considerations, add that the small communities of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals would have had many band members succumbing to sickness. The overall picture would have been populations of proto art users coming under extreme pressure. With the extreme pressure for these populations trying to settle down to a modicum of domesticity, we have what I propose looks a lot like this. The newly domesticated are discovering a chronic oppression, but here intriguingly from the environment. And so in a completely systematic way, early humans become minorants in an agon with nature itself. The artwork and the postulated vocal music would have functioned as the primal utterance of the minorant, saying in effect, we exist. The point of the hands in the silhouettes of red spat on paint on the cave walls are highly suggestive. No great visual achievement, but saying 
100% and saying nothing more than we are here. Part four, a brief look at the more general question of how art began. You might think that soldiering on at this point to the question of where all art came from might be a bit exhausting. But I think that once you can grasp how the idea of tone emerges, in other words, how emotion and high order game playing can be grafted onto purely natural phenomena such as vocal display, it's not that difficult to understand how what is called art emerges. To make this manageable, we're going to look at just one aspect of the art problem, color. And color for our purposes can be black and white. To get us started, a quick run through of general points. One, with evolutionary success comes population increase and domestication. Two, the success high population domestication nexus brings a need for lower aggression. Three, this aggression lowering happens in a completely natural way. The prosperity of the species brings longevity. The longevity brings older breeding pairs. The older breeding pairs bring staggered cohorts of offspring together with such phenomena as the older offspring taking on the roles of asexual parents and a prolonged juvenile stage. And with this latter, a cultivation of neotenous characteristics such as play. The specific biological component in this drift towards neoteny and evolutionary complexity is parents expressing less and less testosterone as they get older. That's our overall evolutionary picture. Where does color come in? Well, originally, the most likely reason for color is camouflage. Animals towards the poles are white and the closer to the equator, the darker they get. Thereafter, as animals range through various terrains, they would, by selection, become attuned to their backgrounds. For example, yellow and dun brown for desert, darker browns for animals in or around trees and dense forest, black, and dark green for animals submerged in water that move slowly, and a light or silver color for those moving fast. And for color designs, light vertical stripes for savanna and terrains with moderate amounts of bush, spots and irregular rings or circles for rocky areas. The underlying biological mechanism for these colors and designs is the expression of melanin. Melanin is in the first instance a completely natural skin pigmenting to protect animals from the sun. The gradations in the expressions of melanin are identified by us as colors. Certain animals that are colorblind experience them only as tones. Color for camouflage is however only a starting point. Later on color can be a marker for health, vigor, capacity to produce poison, aggression, etc. And this marker can be taken to extremes in the fecund world of the tropics. So much for a general overview. For our investigation proper, I thought we might look at just one notable case of colouring in a not especially exotic milieu, the black and white striping of zebras. Because of their piebaldedness and suspiciously mathematical looking stripes, zebras could be mistaken for a domestic species by, say, an intelligence from outer space. But the case of zebras rather perfectly illustrates my point about domestication taking place within wild populations. Because zebras are in fact wild, and they are very hard to domesticate for human activities. An illustration of this is given in an internet video on an American race for zebras, where all the human jockeys are thrown off during the course of a very short run to the winning post. The zebra is, however, not so wild as to be hard to track and observe. And the result of this has been extensive work on a taxonomy, which we are going to rely on heavily. So, zebra evolution. Zebras are, according to me, good candidates for the phenomenon centrifugal speciation. To explain this very briefly, animals living, say, 
here, they experience success, so their numbers increase, and as a consequence, they spill out into territory not originally theirs. Quite possibly because it was not geophysically so attractive. They went to this area because this area was just not that attractive for breeding. They decided this was the best area. Now they're forced to go out into this less attractive area. So they spill out into this remote area. Later times change. The species comes under pressure for some reason. The species retreats back to its original ideal territory. This happens just maybe just once, but more likely several times. Whichever it is, there is a strong chance that some small groups will stay and survive or even have modest prosperity, prosperity out at the periphery. These small groups are called refugial pockets or just relict populations. Relict, i.e. leftover stranded populations. These relict populations provide interesting insights into what the species originally looked like and provide a record of archaic features. Let's see if this holds up for zebras. Here's our map of Africa and the zebra populations. In the zebra populations, we are counting four species. Grevies up here, in Kenya and Ethiopia only. The Cape Mountains, way down south here, the Cape Mountains zebra. The Hartmans over here, mostly in Namibia, and broadly in the center, the quaggas or plain zebra. Notice straight off a nice number of smaller territories for the peripherals. And notice the concomitant for this, small populations. The grevies, 2,600 only, and in danger of going extinct. The Cape Mountains, 1700 and in similar danger. The Hartmans, 9000, a figure from 2008. The centrally located quaggas or plain zebra, on the other hand, despite declining populations, still have the big numbers, variously estimated as 500,000 through to 660,000. The figures for the northern heartland from 2015 are fairly impressive, with Kenya having 98,000 and Tanzania 260,000. So this already fits the pockets at the periphery idea. But what about archaic features for the peripherals? Well, the grevies are the biggest, i.e. the tallest and heaviest of all the zebras. And this is generally an evolutionary feature for animals living in rougher areas, areas low in resources, where battles need to be fought. Also, grevies are for the most part solitaries, both male and female. And antisociality is definitely an archaic feature. The Cape Mountain zebras are smaller with respect to height. Actually, they are the shortest zebra but they are heavily built animals with thick necks. This again is a robuster peripheral design with heavy build and short legs. It is designed for moving over rocky and mountainous terrain. With the Hartmans, we are back again with a large animal living in difficult circumstances, the deserts of Namibia. With our three peripherals, there is also some sexual dimorphism with the male grevy, the male grevy and the female cape bigger. This seems to be an archaic feature related to access to resources. The grevy's male is able to control access to the limited resources in his arid territory, in particular water holes, and needs to be big to be territorial. The smaller cape male, so here the other thing has happened, the smaller cape male seems to have lost all control over resources in the difficult mountainous areas of the south of Africa, an area where territoriality doesn't make sense. 
So to sum up on this, we are giving a big tick for the relict or refugial pockets idea. And what about the idea of advanced features at the center? The center is effectively the domain of the species quagga with, as we've seen, the big populations. Within this very large domain, in so to speak, the dead center, although actually towards the north, up here, is a sort of star performer for the quagga, the Grant's zebra. It has the smallest build of any zebra. This smallest of build is the suitable design for the more social center dwellers and provides mainly the ability to move fast over the flat savanna environment. Moving fast means they can escape predators and that they can arrive efficiently in better pastures. Being able to do this in numbers gives security. Note from this little vignette, the advanced feature, flexibility. So that's the inner quagga domain, but the quagga have a centrifugality of their own, which is to say that they have their own periphery, their own ring structure. So this was the big ring structure. Now we're looking at a smaller ring structure like so, within the area of the quagga. The ring is composed of quagga subspecies. Let's go through them and their own archaic features fairly quickly. We begin with the Barensis, him up here. This is a big zebra with the outstanding feature of no mane. This, according to me, indicates the archaic feature of not being able to signal health or aggression through artificial means. So they are not able to peacefully intimidate within artificial size demonstrations. Think of fish and dorsal fin displays, dogs that raise hackles, human warriors with built up helmets of steel spikes, helmets with horse hair, headdresses with bird feathers or with animal horns, etc. This is the opposite of that. Next, the Isabella over here. This is found in a narrow area of Somalia. Very little seems to have been written about these, but they are also mainless according to the New World Encyclopedia. Next, we come to the three, quotes, southern subspecies, Crawshays, Birchalls, and Chapmans. Here is a Birchall. I'm grouping them together as a completion of the going around of the Grant Zebras up north. So a completion of this, there's a going around in a sense of the central grants. But we have run into a problem. There may be a centrifugal aspect to the relationship between the grants and these latter in that they are bigger than the grants. And this is especially so with the Birchalls and Chapmans, but there are reasons for seeing them as also not that different. They are definitely social animals. They have little sexual dimorphism, which is a sort of biological egalitarianism. They can live in herds and the quite stable stallion plus harem arrangements. The Birchalls can even pair without much male to male competition. The Chapmans are so notably social that they can reside and travel along with many other animals, wildebeests, ostriches, and so on. So what's actually going on here? at the center with the very light two-tiering grants versus southerners speciation. I think the centrifugality story can best be told by the pelage markings, the famous stripes. The grants are the exemplary black and white striped zebras with the white stripes nicely wide and parallel with the nicely wide black stripes. They are therefore appropriately dressed to be our central clear signalers. The southerners have markings with much less definition, which we'll get to in a moment. There have been plenty of theories as to why the stripes exist. The theories cluster into basically six categories. 
one, camouflage, two, aposomatics, three, a dazzle the predator strategy, four, a uniformity of striping within the group to give the impression of being one big animal, five, thermoregulation, the white stripes reflect light creating a sort of panelled cooling, and six, a theory that has apparently risen recently to the top of the pile with a 2012 book by Tim Caro, C-A-R-O, that the stripes disturb the visual system of the hard biting and highly troublesome tsetse fly. There might be a number of reasons for this latter, but at the very least, flies and many insects are highly sensitive to light differentials and more generally don't like being in the dark in the day and don't like being in the light during the night. That's all very interesting, but what should one say about the southern quaggas, Crawshays, Birchalls and Chapmans? They have so-called shadow stripes, dividing the white stripes, the Crawshays only lightly, but with the Birchalls and Chapmans, this is a prominent feature. And a further question, why anyhow is there a rather obvious trend towards whiteness as you go from north to south in the vast central quagga homeland? The answer to problem one, the intermediate stripes given by the big experts is intriguing. They think that the white stripes have become so wide that the black underneath, zebras are supposed to be black skinned, has started to seep through. In other words, they are theorizing a going too farism for the white stripes. Stunning, a successful form is getting out of control. Problem number two, the southern whitening is a real puzzle. My suspicion is that it's a reversion to a previous advanced feature. All this notwithstanding, my answer to reply to two questions and all at once is that if one can speak of irony in biology, then this is it. It's irony in the sense of an, an accelerating and fracturing of meaning in a form. In the same way that human civilization can be considered a curious mixture of accuracy and irony, so with evolutionary developments in the general run of nature. The problem with Caro's one idea explanation regarding the stripes is that when it comes to signals in nature, there is dynamism. It's a fact of evolution. Signals mean what they mean until they start getting mimicked or become too widespread or become too predictable or just aren't doing what they were previously supposed to do. Caro's answer is only, so to say, approximate explanation. Probably just an answer for the Grant's pillage Caro, it should be noted, was stationed in Tanzania for his experiments where there is a predominance of grants. He's, he's further up north in this whole territory. There is a much bigger game going on in nature. It involves the well-known game theory principle, nothing works all the time. And we have one more very compelling example to seal our argument against the single reason for stripes. It is the extinct since 1883 and once numerous Equus quagga quagga of Southern Africa. It used to be located way down here and was right across here in very large numbers. The striping of this animal was something of a vestigial joke. Only the head and neck had any real striping and it faded out over the shoulders with the back half of the animal being a dun brownish color. The undercarriage and legs were completely white. I wonder if Caro holds the view that the tsetse flies were content to bite only the front half and higher parts of the body. So in summary, what I think we are looking at here are two principles. Principle one is centrifugality. Archaic features are found at the periphery and they continue to operate peripherally within the species as well. Principle two, there is a waxing and waning in the advanced central sector itself of the advanced signaling. More generally, we need to state this, signals in nature started off meaning nothing, then later they are selected for because they confer some evolutionary advantage. With zebras, let's follow Caro, 
it's the accidental alignment with the tsetse fly, the tsetse fly's visual system. And then later on still, they can mean next to nothing again. This is not terribly remarkable. Signals are following an oscillating wave pattern that moves towards and away from meaning. And you should expect to find this in all complex life forms. But especially with those species that are going along the higher paths of domestication, don't expect to find very interesting signaling patterns in the crocodile. Part five, a postscript. The claims that the terrorists of today have a theological or any other sort of thought through goal. In the news headlines of today, we are often told that certain murderous atrocities are caused by a particular theological outlook. What I want to say about this is that whilst it might have a veneer of truth, that leaving aside the rather technical question of actual elements of psychopathy, there are strong reasons for seeing such attacks in terms of the game theory we have been outlining. Does anyone ever attribute the behavior of the North Korean state to theology? That would be odd because they don't have any. North Korean religion is an amalgam of not much more than a bit of ancestor worship coupled with the old Chinese ethical ideas of the way. And the acid throwing attacks in Great Britain, which are as old as the 19th century, seem as close to random violence as one could get. I think that understanding such attacks as the outbursts of minorance is much more helpful. The attacks are meaningless bluff, nothing more than a barking at the world. And what should our attitude be toward these minorants? Well, undoubtedly our response should involve calling their bluff from time to time. But I'm recommending that we don't draw any conclusions about them, quotes, having particular goals. Nor should we think that their elimination would solve our modern problems. Rational situational logic dictates that if the radical Islamists, the North Koreans and the British acid throwers were to disappear overnight, their place would in very short order be taken by many other rebels with thin or non-existent causes. The impulse to make noise in a domesticating species is just too strong. Conclusion. What have we learnt in this talk? Thanks to certain papers written in the 1920s by von Neumann and developments in computer capability and AI research involving game playing competitions between computers and humans, we have learnt that the destined to lose out adopt a strategy of bluff, not as a bright idea, but as a matter of survival. This we propose is how noise gets a toehold in toehold in the evolution of a species. The squeaking, squawking, barking, roaring of this planet has its origins with the unhappy and the discomforted. In particular, with the can't look after themselves young. A ramping up and a tidying up of the squeaking occurs when the very speciose, the domestically advanced, are able to code and mathematize their emotional bleating. This is concept music. A key moment in this advance very likely occurred in the wake of a massive volcanic event in Europe 39,000 years ago, when a peculiar agon emerged between humans, plus Neanderthals, the minorants, and a vindictive exterminating nature, the majorant. Humans moved even more determinedly into caves and used the geophysical properties of caves to become musicians. The question of the origins of art, whilst of course encompassing that of the origins of music, is much more difficult. Art really began with sentient life forms doing signaling of any kind. Later on it has developed higher and higher forms of impressing the world with accuracy and irony. We think zebras, possibly an example of speciosity, are an interesting case of animals displaying both accurately and ironically. Thanks.